Since the earliest beginnings of civilization, man has used his energy and ingenuity to cultivate the land. From land and from the rich natural resources it contains, all wealth emerges. We are dependent on the earth for all our needs, for food, for clothing and shelter, for the materials with which we build and manufacture, for the ores and fossil fuels that power our cities and machines, and for the space, the open terrain over which we travel and on which we build. In earlier times, the average man had access to the resources he needed, provided he was willing to use his strength and his wits to make a living. As long as there was still unclaimed space on the face of the earth, no one who was willing to work would lack, at the very least, the barest essentials. But as man advanced, and as the frontiers were appropriated and fenced off, there came a time when the struggle was waged against an adversary far more subtle than raw nature. Human nature. Now... Our rural areas are dominated by huge corporate agricultural conglomerates who have all but driven a small farmer out of the picture. If he's lucky, the average person might be able to hold on to a small piece of land and break his back to squeeze out a living. Or maybe he'll work for the big corporations, making somebody else rich while he struggles to make ends meet. Or maybe he'll pack up and try his luck in the cities, where maybe he'll find work and maybe he won't, because the economy is tight, and just about everybody is cutting production and laying off their employees. Where maybe he'll have a decent place to live, and maybe he won't, because slum lording and speculation and the overall lack of intelligent urban design have turned our cities into a disgrace. Where maybe he'll make it, and maybe he won't. Why is it that today, when we have at our disposal the greatest technology in the history of civilization and the capital and the intelligence to put it to work, we are plagued by unprecedented unemployment, inflation, economic hardship, and crime? Why is it that the further we progress, the more we are afflicted by poverty? Access is the answer. If given free access to resources with tools and knowledge of how to make it work, there are few people on earth who wouldn't jump at the opportunity to make a productive, creative contribution to society, to earn their living and enjoy the fruits of their labor. But the access is not there. A large percentage of both urban and rural land and resources are laying idle, concentrated in the hands of a few powerful entrepreneurs who find it more profitable to speculate than to produce. And a great portion of the wealth that is produced in America is claimed by the least productive element of society. Those who hold land and resources out of production and out of the reach of working people. People who need only access to put these resources to use for themselves and for the community. There are old ideas that are coming back. Ideas that are reflected in the writings of many of the greatest statesmen and thinkers who laid the foundations of these ideas on democracy and free enterprise. Men like John Locke and Thomas Paine, Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill. It is the simple, obvious fact that men did not make the earth, that men cannot create land and natural resources, and therefore no man can claim to own nature. Properly applied, this basic truth can solve our problem of access to economic opportunity. In the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and later in his years as president, Abraham Lincoln eloquently presented the case against human slavery. How can one person presume to own and control the life of another human being? But Lincoln's insight did not stop at slavery. He understood the many forces of oppression which masses of men are everywhere subjected. And he saw the absurdity of treating the planet as private property. The land, the earth God gave man for his home, sustenance and support, should never be the possession of any man. 
An individual or company or enterprise requiring land should hold no more than is required for their home and sustenance, and never more than they have in actual use. All that is not so used should be held for the free use of every family. Lincoln was never able to realize his goal of land and tax reform. The evil of slavery came first. But others after him picked up the thread of the remedy. Out of the Western expansion that followed the Civil War years, there arose a man who developed a carefully worked out plan to cure the spreading disease of economic injustice. Henry George was a man of precise vision, a journalist and social philosopher who viewed the Industrial Depression of America in the 1870s as the result of this one fundamental mistake, the institution of private exploitation of land and natural resources as distinguished from capital. As though he had walked the streets of the future, Henry George foresaw a time when the American frontier would be exhausted, when the victims of economic injustice would no longer be able to strike out and claim new land or build a life by the sweat of their brow. He saw the inexorable trend towards a time when the immense natural resources of America would be concentrated in the hands of the least productive element of society, at the expense of the productivity of mankind, who can barely fulfill his most basic desires. In his monumental work entitled Progress and Poverty, Henry George described the nature of man as an economic animal. He will invariably try to fulfill his desires with the least possible effort. And to do so, he will tend to monopolize the natural opportunities that surround us all and then charge his fellow man for their use. To this basic injustice, George proposed a remedy. We must make land available to all mankind at all times. But though he was not afraid to dream, the author of Progress and Poverty was first and foremost a practical man. Anticipating the objections to such a radical proposal from both the large landholder, who might stand to lose from any change in the status quo, and the small land user, who is never comfortable with sudden change, George outlined a clear and workable method to move smoothly toward a solution. It is not necessary, he wrote, to confiscate land. It is only necessary to collect community-created rental values called economic rent. The idea was not a new one. America had been founded by men who envisioned the emerging nation as a land of equal opportunity in this most basic sense. Though they themselves were of the landed aristocracy, our earliest statesmen knew this same truth. Thomas Jefferson. The earth is given as a common stock for men to labor and to live on. And Thomas Paine. Men did not make the earth. It is the value of the improvement only, not the earth itself, that is individual property. Every proprietor owes to the community a ground rent for the land which he holds. Rent is the key word. Ground rent, said Thomas Paine, or as Henry George described it, economic rent. To understand just what we mean by economic rent, we must first explore and define the natural process by which man creates wealth. Natural resources are the first of three basic elements required to produce wealth. Land. Land for farming, land for mining, land for business and commerce, land for the recreation and expansion of the spirit, Minerals and timber, ore and fuel, sunshine, untapped sources of energy, water and air and wide open spaces, good soil, poor soil, ocean and desert, the stuff that makes this planet arable, workable, shapeable, and ultimately livable. The raw material that lacks only the intervention of human creative energy and intelligence to become something more than just nature. But though we sometimes speak of a wealth of natural resources, true economic wealth is man-created and requires our second essential element, 
labor. Human strength and skill, human energy and effort. Whether we choose to be construction workers or lab technicians or tomato pickers, our time and our energy are ours and ours alone. And it is the undeniable right of every person to enjoy the fruit of his or her labor. The tangible, man-created wealth that emerges from our work upon the land can either be consumed or hoarded, or it can be recycled back into productivity. That portion of the wealth that is turned back into the production cycle and used to create more wealth is called capital. Capital, as defined by Henry George, includes all forms of wealth that are in the process of being exchanged either from one form to another, such as aluminum to be molded into food containers, or from one segment of society to another, such as the tractor trailer that moves the product from manufacturer to seller and from the seller to the buyer. The usual medium of exchange is called money, but the money itself is not capital. The pick and shovel in the hands of labor is capital, as is the wealth used to construct a hydroelectric dam. But the laborer himself is labor and not capital, just as the watershed is only a natural resource, and neither can in any way be said to belong to any man or corporation or public utility. The bulldozer is capital, but not its driver, nor the mountain it moves. Now, we have natural resources, labor, and capital. With these three factors clearly defined, we can begin to understand the underlying confusion in today's economic institutions across the political spectrum. Those who claim to be capitalists on the right in their prevailing understanding of free enterprise fail to distinguish between capital and natural resources. Can an individual or a corporation really claim to own a beach, or a river, or a tract of land? Obviously not. The earth and all its riches are the general property of all mankind, and all should have equal access to the land to develop and cultivate for his own needs and the needs of society. The bulldozer, the steel and cement, these are things that rightfully belong in the realm of the private property in our free enterprise system. On the other hand, the socialists or communists on the left make a different mistake. They fail to distinguish between capital and labor. We in the free world clearly understand that no state or corporate entity can own a human being or appropriate the value of his creative energy. Henry George had a clear insight. He saw that of these three factors that combine to produce wealth, only natural resources truly belong to the community as a whole. Capital and only capital should be the property of the private sector, and the fruits of labor are the rightful property of the laborers themselves. Let society collect its revenues in the form of rent for the use of natural resources, and both capital and labor will be free to grow and flourish to the benefit of all mankind. Before we explore the advantages of this remedy over the present system, let's clearly understand what we mean by rent. The value of land varies widely, from barren, worthless properties you couldn't give away, to high-income downtown developments, where even the airspace sells for hundreds of thousands of dollars per cubic acre. The quality of soil, the water supply, the modes of access and density of the population, all these are factors that determine the value of land. And time and technology have caused land values to rise higher and higher. A hundred years ago, the Alaskan territories were a national laughingstock. Seward's Folly, they called it. And President Lincoln had to practically beg the Congress to complete the purchase for $7.2 million, only two cents an acre. Today, soaring values and the discovery of oil have turned Seward's Folly into one of the most precious tracts of land in the world, conservatively estimated at trillions. 
The value of a particular piece of land is determined by the rent that it potentially commands. The economic rent of a specific piece of land can be roughly calculated as the difference between its maximum potential productivity and that of less productive land actually in use. In other words, the economic rent will be proportional to the purchase price of land sold without improvements. Let's take a simple illustration of an area where oranges are one of the principal crops. The least productive acreage of land in this area can produce perhaps a hundred bushels of oranges per acre. Here, however, on equivalent acreage, where the soil and climate are more favorable, the same farmer with the same investment of capital and labor could produce a thousand bushels of oranges per acre. The value that would be assigned to this richer land would then be calculated as the difference between its productivity of a thousand bushels with that of the least productive land worth a hundred bushels. Since the value of this land is higher, the rent that would be generated is also proportionately higher. When a tax is placed on the economic rent of land, whether used or not, or whether the land is suited for agriculture or industry or urban commerce, the user of the land will inevitably use it and produce wealth to its maximum potential. And because of the continuing incentive to use the land for maximum productivity, the withholding of natural resources for unfair economic advantage will become a thing of the past. Here is a premium piece of land, as yet undeveloped, but harboring the potential for excellent commercial productivity. Situated near a booming metropolitan area and easily accessible from all directions, this property is just begging to be built up into a vacation paradise that will not only provide terrific income for its owner and dozens if not hundreds of jobs, but will be an asset to the public as well. Why then does it sit idle? Yeah, I picked up this property in 67 for $6,000 an acre. Last week, I turned down an offer for nine times what I paid for it. Are you kidding? I got a gold mine here. All I got to do is sit and watch the price go up and up and up. Now, the day I lift a finger to develop this place, my assessment's going to skyrocket. I'm paying almost no taxes now. And if I start building that hotel... I'll be shelling out improvement taxes through the nose long before I ever see a nickel of return on my investment. The county assessor was down just the other day. Speculation is the name of the game. But let's imagine another reality. Let's hear what this same shrewd investor has to say when the entire tax structure is changed so that revenues are collected not from property improvement taxes, but from just the value of the land itself. Economic rent. Oh, yes, this is beautiful property. And I was assessed at a substantially higher value than just about any other land in the county. I was paying an arm and a leg in land value taxes. I couldn't afford to sit on it anymore. I was faced with a choice, either develop it myself or sell out to someone who would. The fantastic thing is that even after the hotel started making money, I still wasn't paying any more taxes than before. So... I can afford to pour some more capital into the property and really put it to work. Hey, I'm working for a living now. Slum lording and speculation, crime and violence that breed in these rotting city slums, all this is the result of our present property tax system. It's a system that discourages building, development, and urban renewal. Taxes on improvement and building materials and production of goods and services encourage landlords to sit back and get fat while doing nothing to use the lands they control. The result is slums because it pays to let them rot, unemployment because non-productivity means no jobs, and inflation because prices soar while production crawls. And the consumer bears the burden. Already saddled with his own property improvement taxes for building and maintaining his home, and income taxes that slice substantial chunks out of his lifestyle, our average American 
ends up paying for the heavy revenues that are levied from public and private industry as well. The industry doesn't blink when they're hit with heavy taxation. They just pass it right along to you. We are born into a very difficult and challenging life, and we're given the strength, the skills, the natural potential, and the imagination to create for ourselves and for our children a world that works, a world that fills the highest desires of human civilization, desire for knowledge, desire for health, desire for human companionship, for close friends and healthy family life, and a sense of community, of love, and of mutual respect. Desire for material things, and for more than material things. Desire for creative way of life, where we earn our basic comforts and share our dreams. Where we work together to go beyond the struggle for subsistence and survival toward the fullest potential of human society. It begins from access to the land, from the realization that the material and spiritual wealth we all desire is available through free and equal access to the limited and unlimited resources that can flow from this fantastic planet through the uninhibited growth of knowledge and know-how in the mind of man. It will begin with a rejection of a corrupt and unworkable tax system that strangles productivity and causes inflation, stagnation, and unemployment, that paralyzes the potential growth of our free enterprise system. It begins with a move toward land value taxation, the clear vision of Henry George, who saw that all revenue should be collected only from a tax on natural resources that are the rightful property of all mankind. It will unleash the enormous potential of management and capital to fill the needs of a rapidly expanding world and solve the ever-increasing problems of unemployment and inflation. No longer will willing and capable individuals be unable to convert their labor into a livelihood for themselves and their families. Perhaps best of all, a tax on economic rent cannot be passed on to the consumer in the form of higher prices and rising cost of living, because the cost of production will no longer be inflated by multiple taxation that rises higher and higher with every increase in production. Modern economists who have followed in the footsteps of Henry George have developed these basic ideas into a complete and comprehensive proposal. Man is entitled to the benefits of what he creates, not to usurp what others have created, and certainly not to monopolize natural resources. The creative right is the most basic right, but who can claim that right with regard to land? We have at our disposal the tools and the resources necessary to build a civilization blessed with material wealth and technological sophistication, a civilization that is free and just in every detail, a civilization that fulfills without compromise the noblest desires of all mankind. As always, the choice is ours. the window by which I write, a great bull is tethered by a rope around his neck. Grazing round and round, he has wound his rope about the stake until now he stands a close prisoner, tantalized by rich grass he cannot reach. Unable even to toss his head to rid him of the flies that cluster on his shoulders. This bull, a very tight of massive strength, who, because he is not wit enough to see how he might be free, suffers want in sight of plenty, and is helplessly preyed upon by weaker creatures, seems to me no unfit emblem of the working masses. But until they trace effect to cause, until they see how they are fettered and how they may be freed, their struggles and outcries are as vain as those of the bull. Nay, they are vainer, 
I shall go out and drive the bull in the way that will untwist this rope. But who shall drive men into freedom? What God created for the use of all should be utilized for the benefit of all. What is produced by the individual belongs rightfully to the individual. Henry George. Men like Henry George are rare, unfortunately. One cannot imagine a more beautiful combination of intellectual keenness, artistic form, and fervent love of justice. Albert Einstein. People do not argue with the teaching of George. They simply do not know it. The teaching of George is irresistibly convincing in its simplicity and clearness. He who becomes acquainted with it cannot but agree. Leo Tolstoy. I have made speeches to you by the yard on the taxation of land values, and you know what a strong supporter I have always been of that policy. Winston Churchill. I believe in the taxation of land values only. Justice Lewis D. Brandeis. A reform like this will be worked out sometime in the future. Abraham Lincoln.